Okay, so thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I thank everyone for coming out and uh, to learn more about this uh, very important topic and meet our, I call them entrepreneurial sheroes. So a funny story about being here today, um, it's about two months ago, I was a speaker at the Hudson Chamber of Commerce event and the topic was around kind of diversity and inclusion. What are the benefits? Um, how to win with diversity and inclusion? And one of my challenges to the Hudson Chamber of Commerce was to kind of get out of your typical networks and I suggested, you know, one idea would be to go and join a meeting at the Warrensville Heights Chamber of Commerce and invite them to the Hudson Chamber of Commerce. So uh, then probably about a month ago, somebody must have heard about that. I got the call from uh, Renee asking to participate um, in this event. So I thought that was pretty funny. Has anyone from Hudson called you guys yet? No. Okay, we'll have to get, have them get on that. Okay, so I would also like to thank our panelists. I have the pleasure of working with all of these wonderful women. Um, three of them are Jumpstart clients. One of them is a fierce advocate for women uh, business owners through her media company and uh, looking forward to talking and learning more about them. But what I wanted to start out with, I wanted to put some context to like why it's so important for us to hear from these women to understand um, the role of female entrepreneurship in this country. So I'm going to start at the U.S. level. Uh, there are 11 million women-owned businesses in the United States. Since 2007, there's been a 45% increase in the number of women-owned businesses. That's in comparison to a 9% increase overall. Um, while those are impressive numbers, even more critical is that these women-owned businesses have increased their number of employees by 18%. Well, overall, there's been a 1% decline in the number of employees that are being created nationally. Um, so they're making a significant impact to our economy. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about kind of who these women are. Uh, there's been a 3.5 million increase in the number of businesses owned by women of color. In fact, 78% of the net new firms that have been created by women are from women of color. Um, there's been a 126% increase since 2007. Um, every day, 845 net new women of color owned businesses are being created, being led by Latina owned businesses, African American owned businesses, um, however, Asian American women owned businesses are contributing significantly to employment and revenue in our economy. Now let's break it down to see what's happening in the Buckeye state. I'm a Buckeye, so I have to talk about that. Um, the state of Ohio is actually in the top 10 for the number of women owned businesses. There's 330,000 women owned businesses. Since 2007, there's been a 33% increase, a 10% increase in the number of employees that these women have uh, hired, and 16% increase in revenue. Um, and getting closer to home, since this topic is about female entrepreneurship in Northeast Ohio, let's talk about Cleveland. Cleveland metropolitan area, which covers um, all of the, the county and additional counties. Since 2006, there's been a 51% increase in the number of women-owned businesses. This includes the recession. Remember, everyone feels, remembers the recession. Um, and uh, you could say in large part due to the job loss because of the recession, women have found they, they have, they've had to find other options. Um, and these women in Cleveland have had an increase in the number of employees of 10% and the number of revenues of 48%. Um, so that's pretty good, 51% increase. However, that state up north, which I should, shall not be named, with a specific city by the name of Detroit, <laughs> <laughs> has had a 121% increase in the number of women-owned businesses. These businesses have had an increase in 23% of employees and 64% increase in revenues. So while the Buckeye State is great, we've got to beat Michigan. <laughs> 
So how do we compete with that state up north? Um, and southern states, which are really driving like the numbers or percentage increases, those numbers are coming from our southern states, from the state of Michigan, and oddly enough, South Dakota. So in my experience as a banker and having the opportunity to work with uh, wonderful women at, uh, at Jumpstart, access to capital, and there's lots of data that speaks to this, is the number one challenge. Women are starting businesses with half the capital of the, net, the average business, and that has a significant short-term and long-term impact on employment, revenues, and many other factors. In fact, women have 36% of the wealth of men. If you're a woman and have never been married, you've got 6% of the wealth of men. And we all know that you know cash moves everything around us. Um, and in addition to just kind of starting out with half the capital, women have a fear of rejection, so they're not applying. They're not, a, they're not seeking investment capital. They're not seeking loans. They're concerned about um, you know, the impact, their ability to be approved. And there's data that speaks to the fact that there's reality behind a lot of that. Um, despite being on an equal playing field as it relates to their financial uh, statements, their business plans, et cetera, women are three times more likely to be rejected for, for loans. So another significant contract con contributor to um, women's ability to reach their full potential is access to social capital. We know it's all about who you know, not necessarily what you know. Women don't have access to key networks that help them to gain access to contracts. In fact, only federal percent of federal contracts, which are subsidized by our tax dollars, go to women-owned businesses, only 5%. Um, Knowledge networks, a lot of, there's a lot to say. Jumpstart has a program with 100 mentors who are out there giving their time so that businesses can avoid the mistakes that they made um, and then also get connected and plugged into their networks. And then capital is also a very important source for um, getting, uh, having networks and relationships is a very important source for understanding how to present yourself and then getting intro important introductions to the right uh, capital providers. And then as we've been reading in the news, and as I personally know from a lot of the client experiences um, that, that some of my clients have had, sexual harassment is a huge challenge. Um, you know, women are trying to, to get investment dollars, they're trying to get capital, they're trying to do business, and too often they have to deal with the unnecessary emotional stress of um, being harassed. So, and as we all know, caregiving, women are the ones that are taking care of the most vulnerable in our, in our society, whether it be kids, or whether it be family members, in many cases, people that aren't even their family members, women are left uh, with that responsibility. So what we're here today to do is to hear and meet some of these women that have, are, that are kind of turning the economic engine of our, of our region. Um, they're gonna talk to us about their businesses so that we can support them and buy from them. They're gonna talk to us about strategies and tactics that they're using to stay in the game and to level up. And they're gonna talk to us about just some of the gaps that they've encountered and some of the challenges that they've experienced. So um, just before I do that, I wanna get a poll in the room uh, and, and I have a good understanding of how many people are actually in business right now. Okay, thank you. And how many people are, are thinking about starting a business or maybe you just started your business? You've got a side hustle and you're wanting to like move that to a full-time business. Okay, great. Um, okay, this, and then how, and public officials, so you're gonna, you know, you guys are the ones that can make things happen. Uh, we're, some of you are public officials again, no pressure. <laughs> Nobody's raising their hand. <laughs> we know who you are. We can read your name tags. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to start with my very first client at Jumpstart, um, a woman who came all the way from Texas, <laughs> um, Houston, Texas, to um, make a significant impact on our economy in Cleveland, and that's Monique Winston of Optima Lender Services. And then have everyone kind of talk about, give us some information about their businesses, uh, just so we can have some context to the, the discussion. Well, good afternoon. 
Um, as Gloria mentioned, my name is Monique Winston, um, and I am actually the CEO of a company called Optima Lender Services. Um, Optima is proudly located in Warrensville Heights. We're right at the intersection of Richmond and Emory. And the service that we provide, which is um, unique to both female-owned businesses as well as minority-owned businesses, is we are a national title and settlement company. So we are centrally located right here in Warrensville Heights, Ohio, but we are licensed and we conduct business in 32 states around the nation. Um, what we provide, I don't know, how many, how many in the room are homeowners? Okay, so from your perspective, when you are buying a home or refinancing a home or taking out a home equity loan or maybe getting foreclosed upon, anything that has to do with real estate, there is something that happens in the background which is traditionally known as a title search. You have to do all the research on the subject property and from a contextual standpoint, people will say, wow, you moved in, um, from corporate America into your own right in the heart of probably the worst economic downturn. But what's key to remember is that in our space, it's a necessary element of any type of real estate transaction. And we also provide that service for both residential and commercial transactions. So when I came to Cleveland, and I have been in Texas for many, many years, but I'm actually originally from Erie, Pennsylvania, and I thought I had to say goodbye to snow, but yeah. uh, <laughs> I guess God had another plan. So I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, went to college and law school in Pittsburgh, and then took off for Texas, and somehow I'm back in Cleveland again. Mm -hmm. But um, again, the service we provide at our clients are typically um, regional and national financial institutions. So that means when typically people are going to refinance or take out a home equity loan, the bank will have to make a selection as to who will provide these back office services. But whenever I'm in a forum such as this, I always try to remind people that ultimately it is your decision. Now most people, because they are not even familiar with this service, don't really care. All you want to know is how much is my payment? All that stuff you do in the background is nice, but how much is my payment? But just from an educational component, when you are doing any type of transaction, you have the right to tell the bank, hey, you know, there's a title company right here in my community, Optimal Lender Services, or one of our other 31 states, that I would like to perform my closing and that I would like to perform my title work. And you can tell that to your bank, to your realtor, so shameless plug there. But again, the no service... No shame, no shame. No shame. The, the service that we provide, like I said, is very instrumental. And it's interesting because as Gloria rattles off the statistics about the pace at which women are growing in business, I'm in an industry that I will tell you that when I travel and I go across the country, there are very few women there are very few women of color because it's just, you know, nobody, when I think about it, when I went to law school, I didn't say, hey, I want to be a title attorney. I probably would have been like, what is that? So it's, it's, a, it's a field that is predominantly white male dominated field. Um, and prior to starting Optima, I was with Corporate America. So I was with Fidelity. I was with Steward and all of the traditional companies that people uh, hear about when they do think about our real estate services on a national level. So that's our story. That's what we provide, and like I said, we are located um, from a centralized operations standpoint right here in Warrensville Heights. So, Thank you. Okay. Uh, Laura Bennett, and uh, I'm one of the very first Jumpstart uh, companies, um, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm the COO of Embrace Pet Insurance, but co-founder of Embrace and uh, actually in the, in the process of transitioning out of Embrace, so it's, that's, a, that's a big step for me. So um, I grew up in England and Scotland, and uh, my parents emigrated to Canada when I was 16, so if you hear a bit of a mixed up yeah. <laughs> thing, it's, it's because I lived there for many years, I lived in Ireland for four years, and I've been in the US uh, 16 years now. I became a US citizen uh, a week ago. Oh, so. right. Oh, all right. That's a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but it, we came to the. I, I worked in the insurance industry for 12 years and uh, became an actuary, so insurance uh, numbers person, if you like. And but I realised that working in a large corporation wasn't my thing, and so I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? Uh, because. 
basically I thought I needed to get out of insurance to find something that would suit my nature a little more. And so I thought, well, if I get an MBA, I could use that to leverage it to, uh, to do other things and get into other industries. So I came to the US to do my MBA and in the first month that I was there, a friend's cat got sick. And she spent over $5,000 on her cat, this is 2001, and said, wow, I should have had pet insurance because she'd come directly from the United Kingdom. Mm. And so long story short, we put together a business plan for the business plan competition because I was the only insurance person in the class, of 760 people. And uh, we won the business plan competition but I realized I'd found my thing. My mother was a veterinary technician as well, and I just understood uh, we didn't have any money for taking care of our pets. That's why my mum became a veterinary technician. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had so many cats and dogs. Um, and so we, we came to Cleveland because my husband got a job with Progressive Insurance, and uh, we've been, I think it's the, the best thing that we ever did. Uh, it's a great location to start a business. Great people who are looking for interesting things to do, well-educated group of, of people here, and just really passionate about, about what's going on. Um, Embrace, we do pet health insurance for cats and, do cats and dogs across the whole of the U.S., all 50 states and Washington, D.C., of course. And, uh, and so it's for the expected and unexpected veterinary bills. And so for those of you that have pets, you go, oh, yeah, I know, it's expensive. <laughs> and so that's what the insurance is for. And we changed... When we came into the industry, we changed it. It was poorly done before, and uh, and we we came up, basically used modern insurance techniques to build a product that actually solved what people needed at the price that was reasonable. Uh, and and so we've changed changed that. We've recently been in business uh, selling policies ten years, and we've just covered our. We're, we now have over a hundred thousand pets insured, and uh, and so I been working on this for 14 years so now I've come to the the point in my life where I say okay now what should I what should I do next I, embrace is my baby and always will be uh, I'm very proud of what we've achieved we we have an amazing culture that's what makes it amazing to, to work there and how we attract people um, we win all sorts of awards for good reason it's uh, it's a great place to work and uh, so now I'm thinking about my next, my next steps. I'm taking some time off and I'm purging my house. It's so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I was just, uh, yeah, this morning I was like, oh, I've got to finish this small section up so I can come out. So, <laughs> so that's my story. <laughs> Thank you. Renee. I'm Renee DeLuca Dolan, president of Contempo Communications. Can you hear me, Steve? Oh, yeah. oh okay. <laughs> you looked like you couldn't hear me. Um, and I founded that company almost 21 years ago, which is amazing to me. But it's interesting to hear Laura and Monique talk because they pivoted out of a corporate role. And I did, too. I was just very young. I worked at American Greetings uh, before I started my own business. And same thing that Laura said. It was a great environment to start a career. But I realized that the corporate America environment wasn't a good place for me. Um, actually, day two, it's a funny story, I was uh, making copies of my resume, and this was back in the old days when they had the huge copy centers, and it got stuck. And one of the interns walked by, and he looked at me, and he said, Renee, is everything okay? I said, I, I got this paper stuck in the copier. And he came out, and he pulled it out, and he looked at it, and he just left. And him and I are still friends today. <laughs> because he's, he's like, I won't say anything. But I stayed there. I stayed there for two years, and I learned everything I possibly could. Um, I was a graphic designer. I went to school at Kent State. Prior to that, I studied at uh, Cleveland Institute of Art. So my background was always fine art, photography, drawing, painting. But I thought, what am I, how am I going to make a business? And you know, how am I going to make any money? As Gloria said, cash is always important. Um, so I went into graphic design at Kent State. And I actually did some videographic work before I went to American Greetings. And then I stayed two years. And I left. But they were my biggest client for probably seven years after I left. Very loyal company. Um, if they like you, you do a good job. So I worked with them till probably 2001 and I think there was change there the company was downsizing at the time and I was ready to move on so I worked at home for a year and I hired some people and here we are 21 years later I run still a creative firm but for the last decade I've been pub publishing a magazine called Cleveland Business Connects um, some of you have been in the magazine 
hopefully have read the magazine. Um, and I, like Laura, I'm in a transition with the magazine. Um, print Today is a hard thing to sell. So we've put the printed edition on hiatus. We're still doing the website. And my core business, again, is creative. So we do visual branding and environmental graphic design and digital uh, creative. So that's what <coughs> grew the business enough for me to start the magazine. Um, so that's that's really my story. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, I'm Tanya Kinlow, the founder of You Gotta Eat, and my business has been around for one year. Um, I'm still in startup, so my, You Gotta Eat is an app, and it is so you can find homemade and fresh made food on demand. So you would go right now. It's on the Apple Store in beta. So you can go on iOS. That's my plug. Everybody pull your phone out. Get that. <laughs> no, really. We can get this business started right now. Uh, <laughs> it's on iOS right now in beta form. So what you do is you go online, um, download the app, invite friends and family, and then you can post actual homemade meals or maybe leftovers that you have or fresh food. And so you've had you've invited your friends and family. So it's a social network for sharing homemade, fresh made, food made from scratch. It also has a second component that is like an Uber for cooks and chefs. So we are recruiting local cooks and chefs that have food safety handling and that use a certified kitchen that can sell fresh made and homemade food through the app. So for convenience um, and, and for your health, you can go on this app and be able to find fresh made and homemade food. So how many people in here eat? <laughs> right, everybody. And how many people have a goal of eating healthy? Um, everybody. And you know, the culture today, we just get stuck because of convenience and time. So hopefully the app this brings technology and our natural you gotta eat together. Really it's a lifestyle change and that's what I'm going after and that's tough. Um, so that's tough. The stats that Gloria mentioned were are tough. Um, but I'm still encouraged. I love having role models and other people well above, before me um, break through ceilings to get here. I was in corporate America for 26 years and worked my way up. I, I, I've only been in Cleveland for three years. I, um, I was promoted here from um, GE Aviation in Cincinnati and came to GE Lighting as the CFO for North America um, and quit a year ago <laughs> to do this. So when you, you when you have a passion about something, again, finance background, but you know, we all eat. And my husband is a chef. My husband of three years is a chef and we thought about opening up a restaurant. So it's interesting how you pivot and life changes and you make these. And so we thought about how we would have a restaurant in the next year, two, three, four, five, as I maybe transition out of corporate. But you know, once the spirit hits you, you follow it. A day comes, and so thank you. And I'm Gloria's been awesome. So one of I signed up with Jumpstart a year ago, and my network just keeps bringing me to other places to bring me here with you today. Thank you. So I heard a couple of things. So first of all, if you are an employer and you have women employees, you might want to take take good care of your women employees. <laughs> <laughs> um, and but conversely, if you work for a, an employer and maybe you've got some entrepreneurial aspirations, we know that GE encourages its employees to be entrepreneurial and to come up with their own innovations. They even provide startup capital for their employees because uh, we know they know that things are changing rapidly and they want to be on top of that. But if you work for an, an employer and you're thinking about going out on your own, uh, I think you know Renee talked about leveraging that, those relationships, making sure you don't burn bridges and leverage those relationships to procure your first client. Um, and then we heard a lot about change as well too. So I know we talked last last month, you learned about millennials and there's a lot of change. I think millennials currently represent 40% of the workforce and will be soon increasing and are, are very different styles and um, expectations when it comes to their work environment. Um, Laura talked about culture and how important that's been to her, the growth and success of her business. So I would love to hear from our, our, our panelists 
Uh, what are some of the strategies that you're using to attract and retain the best talent? Because access to quality talent is probably is a huge barrier to business growth. And every employer that I've really been talking to for the last, at least the last 10 years, has spoken to the fact that not having the right talent that has the right skill set has been detrimental to their growth. So I would love to hear from some of our panelists about some of the things that they're doing to attract and retain talent. Um, and if you've got anything that you're doing special to uh, attract millennial talent, we'd be happy to hear that as well. I can speak to that. Um, from an industry standpoint, um, probably even more significant perhaps for us than access to capital has been um, the ability to attract uh, employees. We are in a field where, so before I moved to Texas, I was in Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is actually sort of the mecca for what we do. You know, they, there are tons of national title companies. At one point, it made up like 10% of all of the employment in Allegheny County. There are large, now again, when I speak in context of a title company, I'm not really speaking of a local title company who services you know, Ohio or Cleveland. Again, I'm talking on a national level. So the environment from which I've always come, there have always been plenty of resources available to fit the variety of positions that we have. And within our organization, one of the things that I really like about our industry is that we are diverse in skill set, meaning we live in a day and age where people often say you can't do anything without at least a bachelor's degree and so on and so forth. This is a particular industry where we actually have the ability to cross-employ all segments, meaning I have people with GEDs and I have people with PhDs. So there are a number of, there are a variety of positions within it because again, we do people who actually close loans, people who actually do title searches, people who are in accounting, people who are in legal. So I like the fact that it can be a fit for maybe a young person who has decided, you know what, after high school, I'm done with school. Can, is there something that I can do where I can actually make a living as well as that professional person? Um, so in the beginning, I never imagined that finding employees would be an issue. I never imagined that um, finding people with a particular work ethic would actually be an issue, but it actually has actually been an issue to the point where we have decide, we have actually had to discuss whether or not being centrally located here was going to be a good fit. So one of the things that we have discovered is that sometimes you have to create, you have to create um, create the solution to your need. So we are actually um, working through now, and um, Vanessa, who's here, who is um, with our HR department, our HR generalist, is actually going to be working with GCP and some other organizations to actually create a high school intern program. Um, and we do, we're, you know, we're in the infant stages, but again, we all know about college interns, and that's great, but why not reach them even younger? Because I can tell you, nobody goes to college, law school, or anything else saying, I want to get into the title industry. It's just not, <laughs> it's just not a known industry. And the people who are, perhaps have majored in business or law or whatever. So knowing that we have the possibility to create solutions, that's something that we are working through creating actually a um, high school internship program. Great, excellent. I mean, that, I mean, that just makes so much sense to me, kind of creating and investing in your own workforce. Um, so kudos to you, Monique. Anyone else want to share? I just have an interesting story. I have, an, I have one employee contractor, actually, and she is a millennial, a year out of school. And what I, I just did my first video, and some comments from friends just yesterday was, you need more millennials. And I thought that was funny because my daughter's in it with me. She's a millennial. And then she did one herself. And so I, and in, in my video, I had a group of millennials sitting around the table. I went and got my GE co-ops and had them, <laughs> <laughs> had them over for dinner and filmed them. So <laughs> <laughs> Efficient. So, <laughs> and um, I was like, well, what do you mean? So I think what I am learning very, very early is that I have to have millennials, mm -hmm. um, even in the front, so other people think mm -hmm. I'm cutting edge and I know what I'm doing. Even when I, even when I did have them, they said I didn't have them enough, which was very interesting. So these are just the small learnings that mm -hmm. I have, and and I think I'm in the digital space because it's an app, 
and certainly all they use is apps and phones. So I, my, my eye is, is on that for sure. Uh, based on your experience in corporate America, are there any differences that you're seeing um, in terms of the, the young lady that you have working with you or some of the co-ops that you've recruited? Yeah, I think the, the, the millennials in corporate the one, there, there's a similarity among all millennials in that they're they're going for it and they're going to do what they want to do. And I would imagine five, ten years down the road, you'll see a lot more millennials leaving earlier if they mm -hmm. want to. They're not going to wait 26 years like I did. They're mm -hmm. going to say, you can take this yes. or or I love it. Mm -hmm. So I think they'll change the the color of corporate America a little faster. Mm. Um, and, and those like um, the young lady who's working with me, she's in Italy now. So she's trying to get a visa to work over there. So she's working remotely already. And we're talking through, we all have Apple, our phones, our computers. So we're, it's easy to FaceTime. Even if technology makes it easier. So she's already defining and being able to be different. It's and so true. it's just that she came out of school a year ago. I would have never been able right. to think like that. Yes. So, yeah, a little bit mm -hmm. of a different yet the same. So being flexible with your terms. Very flexible, yes. Okay, it's, it's, some, it's very important it's to consider. Mm -hmm. So anyone mm -hmm. else want to comment on? Um, I can comment. <laughs> we have had multiple um, full-time employees that were interns originally. Mm -hmm. They were interns at Tri-C, Kent State came in maybe as juniors, did an internship in the summer as a designer, and we've hired them and, and they've stayed on. So the internship programs, those are huge opportunities. Monique just brought that up to engage with the millennials and um, have them on board. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to put a pitch in really for um, the opportunities that are already out there um, for internships and making partnerships with some of the colleges and universities. And Monique mentioned GCP. There's all kinds of resources for internship programs to get the millennials engaged in the workforce. And mm -hmm. culture is a big thing and flexibility. I run a design business, so um, we have a lot of creative people. And creative people apparently don't like to get up early. So um, <laughs> I, I just tell them that they have to be in the office between 8 in the morning and 9.30, and they have to work eight hours a day. And that's it. I mean, if they right. don't want to get there till 9.30 and, you know, my, my two senior designers have been there nine and ten years so we're doing something right and they're senior designers but they're not even 40 yet mm -hmm. do you know what I mean right. so um, they're in their mid-30s but um, we have a, a very flexible work environment um, I have our office um, administrator that came to work for me she was in a very corporate job at an accounting firm and worked 14 16 hours during um, tax season has two young girls and she said I am willing to take a pay cut to work here because I want the flexibility. Her husband's a fireman. She works at home mm -hmm. once a week and she does her job very well and she works eight hours a day and goes home. She's not working 16, 18 hour days. Mm -hmm. So I think flexibility is huge. Yes. And that's another trend that I've uh, seen is that millennials and even non millennials. Not just millennials. Right, exactly. <laughs> are willing to, and I think a lot of this could be attributed to kind of what happened to people during the recession, uh, they're choosing work-life balance or other aspects of their, their lives over kind of the uh, extended work hours. So I think if you're an employer, you know, understanding that, but also kind of creating the type of environment that makes them want to strive and work hard for you and give them the feeling that they're also benefiting from this as well. So um, what about, let's talk about marketing strategy. So um, you know, when I first started in marketing, a lot of marketing was done just hitting the pounding the pavement and calling people on the phone. Um, but in the era of social media, we're finding that a lot of people are still doing that. And that works for some some industries. And I'm kind of curious to hear from our panel, kind of what are some things that maybe you started doing that you're no longer doing in terms of marketing? And, you know, how what are give us an example of some some new techniques that you're, you're implementing? Well, we, we started thinking that it was all going to be online and uh, and in terms of reaching people. And definitely people are searching online, but it's not how they originally necessarily heard about pet insurance. And so you, uh, the internet is a great distribution platform, like a way to sell it. Um, it's not the only marketing platform, but it's, you know, there's a lot of, we do a ton of work on online. And, uh, but, you know, we, we have reps on the ground to, going to veterinarians because that's where the pain point is and, uh, and people, you know, veterinarians are beginning to now trust pet insurance and that it can do and can help hit their clients. But um, we've also gone with strategic partners. So, so the one thing about doing, say, social media is that people are interested, we, we find that much more useful 
for our existing policyholders who want to engage with us as a brand because people want to now. They, they want to feel like they're te dealing with real people and, uh, and, and social media is a great way to do that. Um, and it might be a place where people learn about Embrace but they don't necessarily buy because they happen to stumble across us on Facebook. It, it, that has not been successful for us. Um, but strategic partnerships, so partnerships with Geico, Allstate, all of those, if you go there and talk about pet insurance, you're buying our pet insurance. Um, that you know, you, large numbers of policies with one relationship, um, but you know, we're with you know, you know, big big companies, and we but we have a number of them, and uh, so, so there's just many different ways. Employee benefits, you know, people are now beginning to find employee benefits. Uh, you know, mentions pet insurance, yeah. so getting in there again, you know, it's, it's a whole different channel. Um, but it's not as uh, it's not just the internet and not just social media. Those are actually very minor parts. For us, actually, much bigger is just word of mouth in general. So people having an amazing experience with Embrace and then telling their friends and their friends going, oh, I have a bulldog too. Oh my God, I really should get pet insurance. Um, that kind of thing, when your friend says it, then you really believe it. If we say it, eh, you're just company. Um, so, so that makes it, word of mouth is uh, much more intricate than you can imagine and worth spending time and effort on. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of for businesses to think about uh, their go-to-market strategy from a partnership perspective and the value of thinking about it in that way? Well, the market of uh, partnerships are, I mean, obviously really, really key. You, you, you step into it. You know, you partner with someone. You, have a, you, make, you work out how, what to do with them because when you first start, you don't really know what is, how, do you, how do these partnerships work? What do you do? So for us, I mean, we sell directly to people, but we need either people marketing on our behalf or um, a, the, some sort of association with that organization that makes us look more, you know, because frankly, out of, outside of this room, who's ever heard of Embrace Pet Insurance, right? It's... It's, uh, it's the sexiest title insurance. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, so it's stepping, but it's building, you know, just building on, let's say, a one, and then you see how it works, and then you can go with the next one and sort of fix that maybe you paid too much to for leads or whatever, but you work on it in a stepwise way. And really, really important just to keep just to keep going and you'll find sometimes that your partners part, partner pass you on to others not necessarily that compete with them but in a different tangential field and that's uh, or give you other ideas or just or even just give you the credibility to go for some of these others I mean partnering with USAA is, was a huge achievement for us and um, it gives it opens doors everywhere absolutely everywhere thank you I, I would like to just mention um, it's a couple of things that Gloria said and Laura about um, you know online social media internet marketing as part of your strategy. I still do what Gloria said. A lot of people don't do. I still make phone calls um, and I still go to meetings. And that what what I have done from a marketing perspective, I did things a little bit differently. I created some event series to get in front of clients face to face, and I published a magazine. Well, that magazine was a great marketing tool to get to VPs of marketing, advertising, communications, because they needed creative work. They mm -hmm. needed custom publishing work. So the magazine was like a very nice product that we produced, but it was a marketing opportunity as well. And using social media, I think, with your advocates, which is what Laura's talking about, your partners, your clients, your vendors, they can advocate for you on social media and say how great you are versus us saying how great we are. That's yes. how we use social mm -hmm. media. That's true. Um, in our strategy. So I think it's really important. Um, I've had a couple salespeople that aren't there anymore um, that have come in um, and have not, they, they wouldn't fill out a call sheet. And I realized because they weren't making any calls. They were just sending emails and sending text messages. So I brought them in a room one day and I said, I'm just going to say one thing. When you get an email from somebody that you don't know trying to sell you something, what do you do? And they looked at me and said, delete it. Bingo. You can use that form of communication if you already have an established relationship. But people still do business yeah. with people they know, like, and trust. That's such a cliche, but it's so true. And over the 20 years that I've been in business, I've just been able to expand my network through the marketing avenues and the things that I've done. But I don't do any cold calling. I call people that I know to say, hey, here's what I'm doing. Can I help you? 
and that that's worked for me to grow my business. So. That is uh, a very good point. In fact, there is a lot of data that speaks to the fact that people don't really trust brands anymore. Right. They um, they kind of trust their friends. Mm -hmm. um, they want to engage. They want to feel good about the brand that they're working with. And I, I learned this. Uh, my son, who at the time was probably about 12 years old, he was interested in some new like water gun or something like that. And so for me, my, I would have gone to the store to look for water guns, but his first um, uh, inclination was to go online, go to YouTube, and look up, the see the product demonstrations, and then more importantly, the reviews. And once he kind of saw the product, read the reviews, then he narrowed down, okay, these are, I'm going to go look for these particular water guns. And then we went to the store and found the water guns that sold that. And I find that even me to this, you know, I think all of us, how many of us go to look, depend on the reviews to make a buying decision. And sometimes if it's like, there might be one bad review that kind of plants a seed in your head. So the point of just definitely having a presence is important to be found online because you know the phone is what, where a lot of us are with our phones. Understanding kind of what that presence looks like, but really having, leveraging your network, le leveraging your raving fans to have them kind of talking and speaking and bragging about you and your products and services. But to your point, definitely, um, pounding the pavement, making the phone calls, being persistent, you're not going to close on the first or second or third sale, um, is a very important part of um, revenue generation. Anyone else want to talk? What about you? Like, you're just getting started. I know, and I'm, I'm doing all that digital stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and again, because it's an app, and so social media is important because mm -hmm. that's who, you know, people are on their phone. We, I made a conscious decision and debated with my developer about creating a website versus an app. This is an app and we will back into a website mm -hmm. version because everyone has their phone all the time. Yes. I, how many people are on their computer and then still look at their phone to do stuff? Mm -hmm. And so that clicked for me. He's shaking his head. Yeah, right. <laughs> like that. So. That's your Who's on their phone now? <laughs> right, right. So I, so yeah, so social media, although I am soaking all this up, I know it has to be um, a grassroots effort. I got to get out to events and all of that. And I, I'm actually considering just being here, shifting that from maybe 80% social media, which right now it's all awareness. I'm not selling, you know, anything yet. It's, I want you to know about it check it out let's start feeling but it will be word of mouth because i want people to invite their friends and family yes. just like you said mm -hmm. and then that's how it's going to grow so you can share with your friends and family absolutely and grow. but so i've been looking and a lot of people maybe my age and older um don't look at social media or facebook or whatever right. you know like and they want they got to eat too so <laughs> so it is a mix but i can tell you i've started with social media because that's what's so prevalent within with an app and with technology but i know i'm looking at all the cleveland food events that mm -hmm. are coming up and we're going i'm partnering with all of the commercial kitchens oh that's so smart. yeah so i am definitely it's, it's a combination that depends on the business okay yeah thank you thank you very much so recently i uh was invited to participate in a convening well i would say last October, um, I was invited to participate in a convening sponsored by the Small Business Administration and um, AEL, which works with smaller and micro, micro businesses and it's kind of a, a lobbyist for those businesses. And the topic was on inclusive entrepreneurship. And one of the challenges that they said, they referenced for um, preventing businesses from growing is that businesses aren't really fully leveraging technology. There is a lot of new software, there are apps, there's lots of new resources that helps make to help that helps improve the process of getting your product noticed, getting it on the market, communicating internally, managing your client relationships, and businesses are just not aware of those. And if you are a support organization that's providing services, it would be in your best interest uh, to educate your clients on these resources. So what I would love to hear from our panelists, is kind of like what is the one app or software technology that you can't live without and you strongly encourage um, our audience members to um, invest in or utilize in their business and why? You got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be successful if you're hungry. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> it really, that is for me, I'm tongue in cheek, but um, and there is no, I thought of, I was thinking about that, just my phone in general. So whatever platform you're on becomes very important. And I've learned that as an app developer now, you know, because mm -hmm. then I go to, people say, why didn't you start on Android? Um, because 80% of the population has Android, but there are other, Android has like 30 different platforms within that. Apple is one. So it's actually easier and maybe smarter, more cost efficient to, to do mm. one. And then when I realized my ecosystem is mm -hmm. all Apple. Mm. So my phone, right. my iPad, point. my computer, mm -hmm. and I just can have all my information with me at one time really with one device. So it's not just one app, but I have become, they've got me. They got me. Yeah. Apple's okay. got me. <laughs> <If> you're sticky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. A day to day, as far as apps that I use for my business, I, I or really, software like just Mailchimp, or yeah, just kind oh, of like okay. Me. So uh, we use Constant Contact for all of our email blasts. We use a software program that I've been using for probably eighteen years called Function Fox. So if anybody has project management needs or tracks um, any kind of hours at their business, it's awesome. You can do personnel reports. You can do reports for clients. It's called Function Facts. If you mention my name, I think I get $5 off. It's not very expensive. <laughs> it's, it's X amount of dollars per users per month. I think it depends on the term. Um, but I can't live without that. And my phone. But I operate a phone, an iPad, a laptop, and a stationary computer. So the cloud has been a good friend for me mm -hmm. to exchange all of those and save files and things like that. But yeah, I can't live without my phone. And apps, I use personal apps, Pandora, and I use a running app when mm -hmm. I'm running. But day to day, I don't necessarily use an app. Although today, if I'm at an event, I'll use my Twitter app to post photos and content. Um, but to do business, Mm -hmm. Constant contact is one. I mean, we use QuickBooks. We don't really have a process software. Um, we use Excel for that. And again, Function Fox is something that all of our designers, actually all of our employees use every day. And they're supposed to track their hours every day, but they don't. They usually do it weekly. So. How do you track, uh, do you have a customer relationship management system that you mm -hmm. use to track your... Oh, we've been talking about that for years. Um, <laughs> Oh, Salesforce is something that a lot is very popular. 17 hats is something we've been looking into, but we just have not taken the time. It's like every time I want to take that step, somebody will say, well, by the time you get the software and you get it up and running, it's going to take you a year. And I right now today, I'm the only salesperson. So I just manage an Excel spreadsheet and it works for me. And my office manager is very organized and that works for me. Um, and when I was, um, Selling for the magazine, I talked to you know Smart Business, and they they were in publishing magazines way before I was, and they were still doing everything on Excel. So it's yeah, it's interesting, but yeah, there's tons of database management CRM systems mm -hmm. out there. We're not using any, so there's uh, there's a very there's a free for those of you getting started or that are that maybe you've been around and you're still small. There's a free. Uh, a CRM system, very affordable. If you need enhanced features, called Insightly. And I just strongly, you know, coming from a banking background, oh, being a relationship yeah. manager, it's just, it was a great way for me to kind of keep track of my conversations, manage my pipeline. Um, and now they can be enhanced with your um, email campaigns, your, uh, your sales funnel on your website. So uh, that's just one of many that are really pretty good. Anyone else? Um, I think for me, I think everything is business dependent. So um, when you're national or international or however, you are very much dependent upon your daily operating platform. Mm. So for us, not so much apps and all of that, but in order for us to be centrally located in Warrensville Heights, Ohio, and in clo and close mm, 400 to 600 deals a month across the nation, obviously you have to be um, dependent upon a very robust technology system. So whether it's a proprietary product or something that is off the shelf, but you have to expand. You have to know your business. Our systems have to be multifaceted because we have notaries and attorneys all over the country that work for us. We have all of the land data records because you have to remember when you're searching title, you are actually doing that on a county level. So I'm not dealing with 50 states, I'm dealing with the county level. So you have to have a system that can house information, 
we are um, in a highly regulated environment, especially since the foreclosure crisis that we encountered as a country. We are in an industry that is very heavily regulated. So from a title standpoint, we're considered a financial institution just like the banks. So your system has to meet regulatory compliance. Your system has to be able to meet your daily process flows, which are going to be different in every county and every state that you do. Our system has to be able to schedule appointments if someone is closing at 6 a.m. in Kentucky and 9 p.m. in Florida. So your system has to be a lot. We are very much dependent upon an adequate functioning system. And and so if you are in a business where that is a requirement, you have to up front before you are speaking to banks and all that, you have to have your operating platform intact, tested and everything because it is the basis upon what you do. So for us, we are technology. And again, not just from an app standpoint and from social media, but our very business is dependent upon a million, multi, multi million dollar technology platform. Thank you. Can I just mention uh, one thing that we use completely, slightly different, uh, and by the way, shame on you, Renee. Jeez, <laughs> uh, well, I, I get with it, it in front of all of these people. Um, I could have not told the truth. We, we, use, uh, we just, we just uh, uh, signed up with uh, Tiny Pulse. So we're talking about millennials, and uh, but just people in general want to feel that they're voice is heard in a company and it's actually quite hard to do if you're not unless you know if you're a tiny company it's a bit easier but even then sometimes having an anonymity mm -hmm. matters and being able to give you know not just writing into the suggestion box and putting it in where people don't, aren't motivated and tiny pulse is a survey tool the surveys every you set it up to survey every week and it asks some set questions so you can see a trend for what you know, multiple choice answers on where you know how happy are people, that kind of thing. But also, uh, you can put in questions you specifically want to ask. But it gives an anonymity, and it will actually slice and dice the the information in many different ways. And and you can reply back. That's the important part. You don't just take the suggestions. You have to do something with it. But it allows you to literally respond to the person without knowing who they are. It doesn't mm. matter, but you respond, and then other people see that. So it, it's really, I would say it's changing, changing things for us and in a very, very good way. And trust me, and employee engagement is a high, high, employee engagement is a high predictor of financial success. So what your employees think and say, particularly in terms of your employer brand um, and how active they are in promoting your, your, your brand, your product brand or service brand is very important. So thank you for sharing that. It's like a great tool. Okay, I'm gonna uh, transition into just some uh, more specific questions for each one of our entrepreneurs. So Monique, you relocated to Cleveland from Houston. Um, you didn't have a network here. Um, you didn't necessarily have advisors. Um, and, and, and often kind of sometimes if you're a busy professional, you don't necessarily, or if you're, you've been taking care of a family, you don't necessarily have a, a strong network. So how did you um, build a network of, of advisors and kind of what were some of the lessons that you learned from from that experience? Well, for me, okay, so that's twofold. So yes, I always tell people when I showed up in Cleveland, that's all that showed up. And so here you have someone <laughs> stepping out of corporate America where they have assistants and secretaries and offices and legal assistants. And again, I'm migrating from being um, an underwriting counsel to being a CEO and I just show up. I didn't even have all my family yet because just myself and my younger daughter came so I still had a husband and an older daughter back there. So you show up and again when you think about it and this is a very non-traditional way for a national title company to start like solo. Um, so when you when you show up you have all types of things. I mean you literally don't even have a, I'm like where am I supposed to sit? So you literally don't have. <laughs> Now, before I came, I did have the opportunity to um, correspond with Jumpstart and other organizations, but I tell people all the time, I am in a very relationship-oriented business, um, and again, I can be dealing with the largest bank. I can be dealing with Bank of America or Wells Fargo or PNC, all of those are my clients, but it's very relationship-oriented, and you either produce or you're out. They don't care about all of that, what you're going through to try to start your business. So. I have to admit, and my family always teases me, I'm probably the only person ever in the existence. I don't have a Facebook, never had a Facebook, don't want a Facebook, don't have time. I know I'm nosy, so that would just be something else to distract me. 
But what I do have that was so instrumental is I had a LinkedIn. And it is, we hear, now remember, I'm coming from Houston, Texas to Cleveland. I'm from Erie and Pittsburgh and so on. But over my career, I have developed professional relationships. And we always hear the cliche, don't burn bridges. Okay, that's what you don't do, but let's talk about what you do do. You don't burn bridges, but you foster and you maintain relationships. People knew me from... Fidelity to Stewart to all the companies that I worked with and when I say people knew me I'm talking about the heads of banks that I did I needed those people to continue to know me and know where I am and so again when I showed up I had and the only reason I had LinkedIn is because when I worked for Stewart I had gotten an invite from the CEO to be on LinkedIn and I'm like okay I don't want to do this but I don't think I have a choice but that ended up being a great tool because I'm in Cleveland so I was able to tell people all these bank presidents and people that I know where I am and that I'm here and the, you know what they want to know why did you leave where are you what's going on so it is important not just looking at it from perspective of don't burn bridges maintain and foster those valuable relationships because we are in a technology area where your relationships can be across the country and across the nation and people know other people so even though I didn't really know people in Cleveland I had family here but I didn't know them either so I definitely didn't want to just call them so your people guess what they know people and they'll say hey I need you to call or oh, I called such and such and told them you were been again these are people at a variety of levels so that's first thing carry your relationships with you maintain those ones that are are valuable and again in the years that I've been here and it's funny because now I go into Giant Eagle and someone's like Monique and when I first moved I'm like nobody knows me who's calling but you can quickly build those relationships the other thing all of these affinity groups and trade organizations again people take networking and they think that means you go to a happy hour but you have to connect with the organizations that can help promote not just your business they needed to promote me I can promote my business I need you to promote me to get me so whether it's jumpstart MBDA GCP when I first moved here I said okay if I have another organization I'm so confused and I used to tell Gloria I don't know what any of them do I read the mission statements but one thing I said I said I used to say Cleveland has more organizations to help entrepreneurs and to help people do this and that there is no excuse and even though you may say you know they overlap in mission statements and all of that what they did for me is they embedded me into this com into this community they didn't need to know I'm like I got the title piece don't even worry about that put me in those people places and things magazines forums everywhere you go you have to embed yourself in that community and take advantage and maintain those relationships and those are the same people that told me I'm like when I'm supposed to get my hair done when I'm supposed to get my I mean those are the same people that will help you I mean these are real things I'm like my child is starting my child is starting kindergarten honestly all I heard about before I got here was where not to send them to school in Cleveland and where not to do and then you know I ended up moving in Beachwood and they're like you're good you know so there are people people that will help you and migrate your business world into your personal world but I am such a relationship person I'm telling you relationships 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 thank you <laughs> so uh, Renee yeah. you have just been a survivor but how many years 25 20, in yeah, business I'm in my 21st through year multiple recessions mm -hmm. and depressions and doing those Excel spreadsheets yes <laughs> <laughs> What, how have you kind of like kept up? Uh, how have you stayed in the game? A lot of businesses are closing. And then what are some of these resources that Monique was talking about that you've leveraged? And just recently, um, in December of last year, I graduated from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. Um, it's put on by Tri-C here. And what an amazing experience that was. For years, they were calling me and I was like, I don't have time. It's a lot of time. It's 13 weeks. It's, you know, eight hours a day on a Friday, a couple nights a week, um, lots of homework. And um, I finally said, you know what, I, I was going into my 20th year in business. I, I need to change it up. I'm ready to, um, and they pointed out um, my issues with Excel as well and not having a <laughs> contact management system. So that's like a very open wound that you guys are just really, <laughs> so, but, but what was really interesting, it was um, a diverse group. There were 39 of us, men, women, and all different industries, but at the end of the day, we all had similar issues. Mm -hmm. Documentation was huge. Most of the people in the room that had documented processes had to because they were government regulated um, or funded by um, some form. 
So I learned a ton from that. So I think to just keep learning and networking and engaging with other people, um, Monique said something that's really important. We have a lot of support here for entrepreneurs. Well, you just have to take advantage of that and get involved and you know get involved with your chamber and be a board member volunteer every year we try to take on some type of nonprofit initiative um, and you know some people can't contribute money but you can volunteer you can help fundraise um, I think just getting out there and um, getting educated and continuing to learn is really what has kept me in business and working hard you know everybody says oh being an entrepreneur, you know, a friend will call and say, oh, can you scoot out early? I work more now than I did when I worked at American Greetings. I mean, I was a, I thought I was a stellar employee there, and I worked more than 40 hours a week, but when you're an entrepreneur, it never goes away. It's morning, noon, and night. I send Gloria emails at 3 a.m. Um, Me too. I think the way that it is, but I, I wouldn't change that for anything, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, the work ethic is a huge, is a huge thing. If you're, if you're not an entrepreneur and you're thinking about it, um, it's not for the weary. I mean, you have to keep up with trends. You have to keep up with education, and you have to build a really great network and support system. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Laura, so you have an MBA from the Wharton School of Business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've also heard, often heard some entrepreneurs kind of regret that they didn't go to business school, and they feel as though they're missing something. Um, just kind of what, in, in actually running and starting a business, what was something that you can share that's important for all entrepreneurs to know um, regardless of whether they've had a, an MBA or what, a MBA, what are kind of some core principles that they need to understand and know to be successful? Well, um, that in, first of all, an MBA is very expensive. I still have my <laughs> loans, just so you know. <laughs> it's not all that sexy. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it gave me the confidence to break out and do what what I do and also so so I think that um, one of the things that I learned from doing my MBA at Wharton because I was surrounded by the most ridiculous people I mean they were amazing so I, I thought oh maybe if I pretend to be like them I I'd learn you know I'd like the rub rub off but one of the things I did learn was uh, Never be afraid, and I, you know, Monique said it. You know, the networking thing. Never, never feel like you're not in the place. You're not worthy of making connections with certain people. I, uh, I've pitched Warren Buffett, and he's he's written me back. Mm. And um, you know, uh, just just CEOs of companies. You do it the right way and research. You know, for me, I'm 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 an introvert. So I have to find my way to, to network, and but but when I'm with people, I can you know I really do connect and and understand people. So I use that to my advantage and just work it in the way that I can. So I think just the, the business knowledge it just gave me the the confidence to go. You know what? There's no one in this world that I won't reach out to and talk to, and just work out how to do that. And it's not always picking up the phone. That that's sort of a how some people might do it, but there are other ways. I mean, I, I pitched uh, Peter Lewis by, um, <laughs> so Peter Lewis is CEO, was a CEO and really mostly the founder of, of Progressive. He didn't found it, but his father did, but he inherited it at a very young age and basically grew it into this amazing company. Very eccentric person, mm -hmm. as you may know. <laughs> and um, so I researched all there was to research about him and uh, I, I wrote a letter and said, you know, basically connected the fact that you know I was trying to be a little scrappy entrepreneur in insurance, a bit like what his career was. But uh, I also packaged it with a bottle of wine, and the bottle of wine though was different because the label it looked like a French chateau label. But if you looked at it really closely, it was a uh, an etching with a person standing there being beamed up by a flying saucer, and uh, it's a very good <laughs> bottle of wine. It sounds a bit hokey, but it's a very good. So it was quality, but. Mm this quirkiness that is just like him and he phoned me back the next day when I got it to him but I worked out how to get it to him because he's got lots of screeners so you just use you know so that's really I'm not saying that you know you don't need an MBA you can just do that I'm saying that there are many ways to to get where you need and having an MBA is one thing but also doing local um, the Aviatra is a new organization that was Bad Girl Ventures, yes. and they have an educational component, and it's really, really good. So if you're thinking about starting a business and you don't know where to start, they're, they're exactly what you need to get started. All right, thank very you. Helpful. And then just real quickly, um, for our newest uh, business owner, can you just share, in terms of the gaps, 
give us one or two words in terms of like what's, we've got these great resources, we've got an audience here of people that can write letters, that can advocate, we've got politicians. What are some things that are missing in the entrepreneurial ecosystem that can help entrepreneurs to be more successful? Oh, you started with that. Money. Okay. <laughs> Capital. <laughs> okay. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> But that is the gap, I think, when you're starting out. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough people. If you had some more money, you could help hire people. And you could, so it all sort of comes back to access to capital. Amen. So we've uh, heard from this wonderful group of uh, sheroes. Let's give them all a hand. Thank you. So access to capital, social capital, um, and just we have an understanding of what they can do to drive our economy. So let let so let's make that happen. Thank you. On your desk, you've got some information from Jumpstart that speaks to capital sources for female entrepreneurs. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to send you some links after or after the event, uh, maybe over the course of the week, to share some of the gr other great resources that are available. Thank you.